Okay. All right, tonight we're going to be in Psalm 19. Psalm 19. C.S. Lewis calls this psalm the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. So, if somebody with the literary uh, genius of C.S. Lewis thought so highly of this psalm, certainly it has some truth for our lives. Psalm 19, and we'll start in the introduction. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their, lang- where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this wonderful psalm and all of the truths that it holds, truths about your uh, creation, truths about your word, and truths about our own conscience. We pray that tonight you would bless us with knowledge and wisdom from this psalm and that we would go out of here greater, uh, better than when we came in. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. In this psalm, uh, we're going to look at three different things that point us to God in our lives. And it's actually well structured in this psalm. And uh, some, some commentators have called these the three books, the three books. And, and these three books that are held on this psalm tell us about God, what he is, what, what he is like, uh, what he wants from us, and how we line up and, and follow his law. And the titles of these three books are as follows, Creation, Revelation, and Compunction. Now, I, I use those three words initially because they rhyme and they sound good, and maybe they'll help you remember, but let me elaborate on those a little bit, because maybe they're not the most specifically accurate titles. When I say creation being the first book, I'm talking about general revelation. I'm talking about the created world, what we can know about God from from what we learn uh, about the world as we can see it. Uh, the, the, the animals and the trees and the plants and, and the beautiful landscapes, the, the universe and the stars, all that is, is falling under creation. When I say revelation, I'm specifically talking about uh, s- uh, special revelation, and, and especially as we find it in the scriptures here, the law of the Lord. And when I say compunction, I mean the, the human conscience, specifically the regenerate conscience as opposed to the unregenerate conscience. And so those are the three books that we're going to look at tonight. We we can see the first one, creation, in verses 1 through 6, revelation in 7 through 11, and compunction in 12 through 14. And again, when we look at these three books properly, they tell us about God and and what he wants from us and how we can uh, line up with his law. 
And as we go down through these uh, different themes in the book, we're going to see how each one draws us closer to God, and, and properly using each one will draw us closer to the Lord. So first of all, we're going we're to look at creation as David talks about it here in Psalm 19. Let's read uh, verse 1 again. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. And uh, we can know from the created order, the first thing that we know when we look at creation is that there is a God. That God exists. I'm sure you've probably heard, heard um, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but the, the the divine watchmaker uh, analogy. You, you find a watch on the street and you look at it and you say, somebody must have made this. Somebody intelligent had to have put this together, put all the pieces of this together. This couldn't have just happened by itself. And, and so when we look at the created order, when we look at, at all the different symbiotic relationships in, in the world, how all of these different animals depend, and, and plants depend on each other to survive, we know that this didn't just happen. Somebody had to put all of this together. Some master planner had to plan this universe out. Uh, Aristotle, who certainly wasn't a Christian, uh, said, Should a man live underground and afterwards be brought up into the open day and see the several glories of the heaven and earth, he would immediately pronounce them the works of such a being as we define God to be. And so even Aristotle said that, that the, the created order, the, the things that we see in the earth, point to a, a great designer. Charles Spurgeon says, he who looks to the firmament and then writes himself down an atheist, brands himself at the same moment an idiot or a liar. He's saying that, that you, can, you can't look at creation and say, this just, this just happened. You, you have to know that, that there is a, a designer behind this. And so the first thing we know, the first thing that David tells us is that we can tell from creation, we can know from creation that there is a God. Verse 2 says, day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. And David t uh, continues talking about the created order by talking about the, the repetition of day after night and, and day after night. And it's, it's truly a blessing that, that God gives us to be able to, day after day, see, uh, have an opportunity to, to witness the wonderful things of his creation. And, and, and so we... we through the, through the created order, through all the wonderful things God has made, uh, we can tell two specific things about him. We, we, first of all, we know that, that he is beautiful himself, that, that God is beautiful, because whoever made this creation, we, can, we look at these wonderful, beautiful things, and we, we know that whoever made this must have been beautiful themselves. They must love beauty and themselves be beautiful. What's further, we, we see the love of God through this. We, we just read that... that um, Day, uh, day unto day utter speech. He's talking about the, the day and the night cycle. And we know that we as humans are, are perfectly adapted to live in this earth because we have this, uh, we have this circadian rhythm. And we need the, the night for the sleep. We need the day for the, for, uh, you know, to, to do work and such. And we have this perfect rhythm that, that aligns with that schedule. And so we see the love of God in, in preparing for us this world that is exactly how we need it. And in verse 3, David t continues talking about this created order, and he talks about how the, the testimony to God is, is universal. He says in verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And in verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What he's saying that, is that no matter where you go in, creation, in, in, in the world, no matter where you go, no matter what language you speak, you can see the testimony of the glory of the Lord in the creation. If you go to the, the, the uh, far south, the far tip of Africa, or if you go to the, the, the far north in the Arctic, you can see through the beautiful landscapes, through the stars of heaven, through the creatures that you see, from, from the, uh, the, the plant life, you can see the glory of God declared. No matter what language you speak, that glory shines through in, in the creation. It's like the wordless book. The world is, the created order is truly the wordless book. And then we get this um, interesting section from the end of verse 4 uh, into verse 6. It says, uh, at the end of verse 4, in them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. 
Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so not, not only has God designed all these things, but he's designed them in, in a joyful way. He's designed uh, the sun to, to metaphorically love uh, rising every day. He, he uses these wonderful, this wonderful language of joy as, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber or as a strong man to run a race. He's saying that the, the, the whole created order uh, uh, glories in its being created by God. It, it's a joyful thing. The, the created order is a joyful thing. And this is especially true of, of before uh, the fall of man. When, when all the created order was in, in perfect communion with God, when there was no sin, when everything was, was still perfect. And even though uh, the fall did happen, and even though, uh, as we learn in um, Romans 8, that the creation groans under sin, we still see these, these, these imprints of the original beauty, beauty of creation in the stars and in, in all the things that are around us. And uh, the, uh, just a quick note on, on verse 6. Let's read that again. It's, it's rising is from one end of heaven, and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Some commentators have argued that this passage, this is just a note in passing, but some commentators have have, uh, marked that this passage uh, might be speaking of the gospel times, might be foreshadowing the gospel times. And and this is because um, just like... uh, because the gospel, after the resurrection of Christ, spread to all the earth. There's nowhere where the gospel is not found. And that's just, that's just a note in passing. Some, some commentators, uh, Jonathan Edwards was the one, the one who held this view. And they back up this claim by, uh, by saying, referencing uh, Romans 10, 18, where, where uh, Paul cites this verse in speaking specifically of the gospel. And so they say they, they believe this has a deeper meaning to that. And I'll, I'll lead you to, to judge on that one. Uh, but I, I figured I'd, I'd note that in passing. So this is, uh, this is the first of God's books. This is creation. We, we first learn of God through creation. But certainly this is not uh, enough to know the triune God of the scriptures. And in fact, I think that this is highlighted in the very language of the text because if you were to look at it in Hebrew, uh, and you can even see it in English, um, the covenant name for, for God, Jehovah in Hebrew, or we would translate it as Lord with, with capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's not in these passages. It's not in these first verses. Uh, instead, the, the, the name uh, for God, which is L, E-L, is, is used when it says the heavens declare the glory of God. And so we can certainly see that there is a, a we can certainly see through creation that there is a God, but we don't have enough to, to know about and to enter into relationship with, with Jehovah of the Bible. And so for that, we need the, the second book, which is the scriptures. And we have a bunch, uh, starting in verse 7, we have a bunch of these um, verses speaking about the excellencies of the Bible. And I'm going to run through these quickly and make a, a little bit of a running commentary because most of them, most of them they really all say the same thing, and that is that the, the, the law of the Lord is perfect, as it says in the first line. The law of the Lord is perfect, and it contains everything that we need for faith and practice. Verse 7 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And certainly it's true that, that God's law uh, plays a part in the conversion of, of mankind, but a better translation of this word uh, convert, converting, as we have in our New King James, would be reviving or refreshing the soul. And certainly it is refreshing to to read God's word and to see uh, in our lives what what points we are not conformed to God's law and and to to renew ourselves in these points and to fashion ourselves after the will of God. The the end of verse 7, and I'm going to work in these these lines, so we're going to probably split a couple verses here. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And when it says, uh, whenever it says wisdom, especially in the, the wisdom literature in the Bible, uh, it, it is not defined as we would define it in our modern context. When we say somebody is wise, we mean that they, they have a, uh, uh, they can soundly apply practical knowledge. They, they can soundly apply this, this practical knowledge that they have. But this isn't what the Bible is talking about. When, when the Bible is, talks about wisdom and, and somebody being wise or somebody being foolish, it's talking about their relationship to the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 9.10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So what it's saying is that the, the testimony of the Lord can, can bring the foolish ones into relationship with God. Verse 8 says, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. I think there's a certain joy that comes with discovering more about God and, and refreshing ourselves in the things that we already know about God. There's a certain joy in that. I remember when I, when I first started studying Reformed theology, it was very exciting to me to, to learn more about God and, and to, to know these things. And I think that, that even uh, when we, we, we have uh, walked with the Lord for a long time and, and we think that we know a lot of things, I, I think that refreshing our, our, our minds in the word can be rejoicing as well. The, the end of verse 8 says, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And I think there's, it's, it's discouraging because we find so little purity in the world today. And, and even that word, uh, purity, has kind of come to have this negative context. We hear uh, puritan or puritanical, and that, that's usually meant, when we hear it in the world, it's meant in a negative context. But, it, but it's, it's so rejoicing to know that, that it's so joy. Uh, um, it's, it's so good to know that, that, that God's word is pure, that everything in it is clean. And the verse verse nine says, "The fear of the Lord is is clean." It says it again. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. God's word endures forever. It says, "The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether." No matter what the world says about God's law, we know that it's. It's true. We know that everything in this book is true. And not only is it true, but it's also righteous. And it's said in a righteous way. I think that, that we can, at times, we can speak the truth, but, but not in righteousness. I think sometimes we, we can use the truth to hurt other people. And that's, that's certainly, we, we should be careful to, to only speak the truth, but we should not use the truth to try to, to hurt other people. We try to use the, the truth in a righteous way to, to build up people, to, to bring them along. And certainly, that's what God's word does. It uses the truth in a righteous way to bring sinners to Christ, to warn uh, sinners. And then uh, David finishes off this section in verses 10 and 11. He finishes off the second book of the scriptures. He says, More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. I think that a lot of times we uh, take the scriptures for granted. That's because we have such a, a high supply. We, the, the Bible is so accessible to us nowadays. I, I think that I, I probably have five or six Bibles in my possession. I know that my roommates at least have one, maybe more than that. And I'm sure that you all have, have more than one in your house as well, or at least one. And, and so it's, we're so the, the Bible is so accessible to us that, that we kind of take it for granted. But we have to remember uh, that we are, are blessed more than any other age in, in our ability to read God's Word. We think about the Middle Ages where most people couldn't read. And so they couldn't read the Bible. They, they could only hear it through the, the preaching of the Word, the reading of the Word, or, or through the Psalms that were sung. Um, and even if they, they could read, the Bible was so expensive that they hand copied it down. It was so expensive that, that nobody could afford it anyway. We think about places in the world where the Bible is illegal and people take great risks just to get the Bible over there. Places like, like China and stuff like that. And, and we, we take the, the word for granted. But we, we need to remember that it, it is so precious. It is, is more valuable than all the gold in the world. You could take all, all the, the billionaires and all their money and stack it up in a heap. You could take uh, Bill Gates' money, Jeff Bezos' money, all their money and, and stack it in one room. And it's, it's still less valuable than this. Because gold cannot save us, but the word of God can save us. It is pure. It has the, the, the words of life. I like this quote. Uh, this is from the 17th century Anglican commentator John Trapp. He says about uh, verse 10, Old people are for, all for profit. The young people for pleasure. Here's gold for the one, yea, the finest gold in great quantity. Here's honey for the other, yea, live honey dropping from the comb. What he's saying is that the Bible contains what everybody truly needs and wants. The Bible has, has, has something for everybody. And not, not in a way that you can pick it apart and take the parts which you want, but, but you take it all together and it truly has truth for everyone. And he finishes off by saying that the, the scriptures warn God's people 
and, and also rewards them. It warns uh, uh, the God's people uh, by telling them what, what God hates, the sin that God despises. And then it shows them that they will be rewarded for following in these precepts. And I, I apologize for, for running through these quickly, but I just wanted to highlight uh, each of them specifically. But the, the sum of the matter is that God's word is perfect and that it is applicable to us and that it can help us to reform our ways and to grow closer to God. And so you see that, that we're getting closer to being uh, in a relationship with God. We see that uh, the creation teaches us about God. He te- teaches us that there is a God. It teaches us that he loves us and that he's beautiful. And now we see from uh, the second book, this book of the scriptures, how we are to live in the light of God's law, what God's law is and how we are to live. But still, up to this point, all of this could profit us nothing if we did not open the third book, and that is the book of our own conscience. We can delight in God's law all we want, but it doesn't do anything until we apply it to our lives. We can, there, there are plenty of... Um, textual, critical scholars who study the Bible, even for a living, even even make that their life's work, and yet they will still find themselves in hell because they did not apply it to their own lives, because it was just theoretical to them, because it was was distant to them, it was just an academic study. So until we open this third book and apply God's law and and the precepts we find into it, in our our conscience, into our conscience, then, then it does not profit us anything. And this is what David does. In verse, starting in verse 12, he, he begins to apply the word of God to himself. He says, who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. And so in the first line, it's undisputed that David is talking about uh, the, the fact that, that we have so much sin in our life that sometimes we don't even realize all of it. There are ways in which we fall and ways in which we fail that we don't even we don't even, are not even aware to us. We don't even see them. And so David is asking uh, God to, to show these things to him and to, to cleanse them, uh, cleanse him from them as well. But the second line, when it says, cleanse me from secret faults, uh, that could be speaking about the same thing, about errors that, that, and sins that he doesn't even know about. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, this was a verse uh, that was heavily used by the reformers when they were uh, debating the, the Catholic uh, the Roman Catholic Church and their uh, um, audible confession. Because t- to be forgiven, they, the, the Catholics, I don't know if they still say this, but they used to say you have to confess every sin specifically. But what David is asking for here is that God would cleanse him of the sins that he doesn't even know about. And certainly that would go against the, the Roman Catholic notion of, of uh, repentance. That's, that's very interesting um, that this was a verse heavily used by the Reformers. But, but there's a second understanding um, of what secret faults are. There are some commentators who, who differ on this. And, and the second opinion is that secret faults are sins that we commit behind closed doors. Sins that are uh, hidden to everybody except for us. And um, I think that these types of sins are certainly much more dangerous to us. Because, um, I should have written this one down, but there's one commentator who says, when we commit these types of sins, we don't uh, experience the benefit of open sinning. If that's, that sounds weird, what, what he's saying is that when we sin openly, we, we have pastors, we have brothers in Christ who can correct us. We can say, hey, I think that you're, you're, you're doing this wrong here. And we can see this sin and, re- and rejoice in it, that, that, that we repented from it. But when we, we commit sin behind closed doors, uh, nobody sees it. And so unless the, the Holy Spirit convicts us to a point where we get rid of the sin in our lives, we, we are going to stick with it. And often these, these sins uh, make us into hypocrites because we, we, we perceive ourselves in such a way that if, if nobody else knows that I'm doing this, then I'm not really doing it. And we kind of clear ourselves in that way. Nobody knows that I'm doing this, so, so in the eyes of the world, I'm, I'm, I'm free from this sin. And so it becomes easier to judge other people who, who commit this sin. We know that our, our judge is God not other people. So David repents of, of secret sins, but next he, he also repents of, of uh, presumptuous sins. Verse 13, he says, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. There's, there's some who say there are three types of sin. There are secret sins, which, which we don't know about, which is the first definition that I gave you of, of secret sins, sins that we don't even know about. 
sins of, um, let me find it here, sins of infirmity, and, and those, they define those as those that arise from surprise or snares of the flesh, and usually they use the example of, of Peter denying Christ. He was, he was afraid of, of dying. He was, he, was kind of, he was kind of trapped. It was his infirmity that, that caused him to sin. Certainly, he was, he was guilty of the sin, but then the third one is, is presumptuous sin, and these are sins that, that we full well know these are evil. We don't have any, I don't want to say excuse, but we don't have any excuse to commit them, and yet we commit them anyway. And we need to be careful to nip these kind of sins in the bud. But the, the most common, I was, I was reading through Spurgeon's commentary, and he has uh, a bunch of, of sayings about, he has a bunch of, uh, a compilation of commentaries on each single verse, and, and the overwhelming majority of, of the examples used for presumptuous sin was David and Bathsheba. Because David knew exactly what God's law said. He knew that, that what God said about adultery, he knew what God said about murder, and yet he did these things anyway, full well, knowing that they were wrong. And we need to be careful to, to nip these kind of sins in the bud as, as soon as they rear their head. Because David didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to commit adultery and commit murder. No, he started with the, the little sin of, of uh, taking a, a presumptuous look at, at Uriah's wife, and that built up to adultery and, and finally to murdering one of his friends. And so we need to make sure that we, that we kill these sins as soon as we see them. One commentator, Ezekiel Hopkins, says, a sin that at first arises in the soul, but as a small mist and is scarcely discernible, if it be not scattered by the breath of prayer, it will at length overspread the whole life and become most tempestuous and raging. We don't know uh, what sin is, is going to cause us to fall in a major way. I think certainly we often commit sins and, and we're able to, to stifle them before they grow large, but we, need to, we, we never know what sin is, is really going to get us. And so as soon as we see sin in our lives, we need to begin getting rid of it. We need to work our hardest to get rid of it. Augustine says, if you are a Christian, do not be afraid of any human tyrant outside yourself. Fear the evil within you your own unruly desires. And certainly that is true. We have no fear of, of those who, who can kill the body, but we have fear of, of the devil and, and fear of our own uh, fleshly um, iniquities. David finishes off the psalm in verse 14. He says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Once more, uh, quoting Augustine, he says, A proud soul wants to be pleasing to the public. But a humble soul wants to give pleasure in secret where God sees. So what David is, is, is asking here is that not only would, would God uh, find his deeds acceptable, not only would God cleanse him from sin so that he is doing good things with his, with his deeds, but also that the meditation of his heart, his very thoughts and attitudes would be acceptable to God. And he's not asking that, that God would condescend and, and be gracious to sinful thoughts and behaviors. What he's asking is that God would, would, would elevate his, his meditation and the thought of his heart to be righteous. And that, that he would not just be doing right outwardly, but that all of his thoughts would constantly be on God's law. That all of his thoughts would constantly be pleasing and acceptable to God. And in the last sentence of the psalm, David gives God glory and he gives himself a word of comfort. God is our redeemer and strength, and he deserves to be praised for that. But also that is so comforting to us. We know that he has saved us from our sins, and he will continue to save us from every affliction that continues in this life. So tonight we've, we've looked at these th uh, three books of God. We've looked at the creation, we've looked at the, the revelation in the scriptures, and we looked at the compunction, our own conscience. We've seen how these books tell us about God, and we've seen how each individual one brings us closer to God. First, we, we know that, that God exists because we, we can see him and his glory in creation. We know what his will is for us because we read it in the scriptures, and we know uh, how, how we are aligning up with this when we read our own conscience, and when we repair what, what is wrong in our lives. So what are we going to do about this? What, what, what is the application tonight? I'll just give this quickly here. Well, first of all, I think that we need to be more careful about valuing creation in light of its creator. And anytime we, we see these, we, we, we always see these, these beautiful things in nature. 
We see uh, sunsets and sunrise. Uh, you can go to the zoo and see all these, these great creatures uh, from all around the world. Even, even the wildlife we have here in South Carolina, it's, it's all beautiful. And I think that, that we are uh, amiss when we enjoy that without giving proper glory to God. I think that when we, we, we look at something, as a landscape that's beautiful or an animal that really catches our eye, we should not just say, oh, that's, that's beautiful and walk away. I think we should say, God made this. My father made this. We should give glory to God. I think it, it, the creation, the beautiful things in creation now also should remind us of the new heavens and the new earth. When, when all of, of the creation, the, the new creation will be at peace. There will be no wild animals tearing each other apart. There will be no thorns and thistles. But, but everything will be beautiful and beautifully restored to the joy that it was before the fall. Second, I think that we should recognize the value and the beauty of Scripture. Um, the, the Scriptures tell us, the, uh, give us the knowledge to act in the way that God wants us to act. And that is certainly a, a great gift. And I think that we've all been guilty of, of reading our Bibles just because it's something that we do. And I actually haven't uh, done my devotions yet today. I was in a rush this morning, and I, I didn't want it to just to be something I do just to check it off. So I hope to do it when I go home. But, but we often, we just do our, our devotions in the morning just because, oh, it's, it's, you know, the next thing on the list. Instead of ge- uh, gleaning from it something that will help us through the day, something that will keep us from sin and, and keep us oriented towards God. We need to be more careful about how we approach the scripture. And when we look at all the different ways that God, uh, excuse me, David describes God words, God, God's word. He describes it as uh, perfect and refreshing, sure and wisdom giving. Right, joyful, and uh, pure, enlightening, true, righteous, and more valuable than gold and more delicious than honey. And, and how dare we, we approach this in, in such a cavalier way. And lastly, um, we should take God's truth and, and we should look at the law of God. The law meaning all of scripture, all of the entire uh, uh, text of scripture. The narratives and, and the laws and, and the uh, doctrinal passages, and, and examine those in light of our own law, uh, in, in light of our own conscience, and then look at in what we are out, in what ways we are out of step with God's word, and, and closely align ourselves to God's word. Constantly be meditating on it. Constantly be asking, in what ways am I sinning? In what ways do I need to improve? And so, not just approach religion as an academic thing or as a social thing or as anything like that, but as a life-altering thing. When we read the, the Word of God and come to church every week, our lives should certainly be changed by it. And as, as we walk with the Lord for a long time, perhaps that's not as radical as it was when we first got saved, when we first started walking with Christ. But certainly, uh, as we continue walking in our lives, we should improve uh, in an upward slant through, through our entire lives. So it's not enough to read God's Word. We must simply, we must also apply it to ourselves. So I think it's a blessing that, that God has given us so many ways that we can see his glory, so many ways that we can be closer to him, and, and I hope that, that this has been a help to you, and uh, it's, it's certainly a lovely psalm, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I have, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this psalm, we thank you so much for the three books of creation, revelation, and compunction, how each one brings us closer to you when used properly. We pray that you would Help us to use these things properly. We pray that you would help us to value your creation and to, to glory in, in your glory in light of creation. We pray that we would uh, approach the scriptures in a more serious way, that we would not just do it as, we would not just complete our devotions and go to church and hear the scriptures as, as something that we just do because it's, it's a pattern in our life, but something that, that we do because we want to hear your truth from it. We pray that we would also apply it to our lives. We would look at our conscience and and search our souls and see in what ways we are out of step with God's word. And even what uh, what ways we are in step with God's word and improve those. Strengthen what is still there. I pray that everyone here tonight would, would have gotten something out of this. That they'd be encouraged in their personal walk. And I pray that you bless this time of prayer to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anyone need a prayer sheet?